Father's great prayer of confession in chapter 9, he and the people make a promise to be faithful to God. Chapter 9, the last verse, verse 38. In view of all this, we are making a binding agreement, putting it in writing, and our leaders, our Levites and priests, are affixing their seals to it. He then lists who has signed up to the agreement, and we get to chapter 10, verses 28 and 29. The rest of the people, priests, Levites, gatekeepers, musicians, temple servants, and all who separated themselves from the neighboring peoples for the sake of the law of God, together with their wives and all their sons and daughters who are able to understand, all these now join their fellow Israelites, the nobles, and bind themselves with a curse and an oath to follow the law of God given through Moses, the servant of God, and to obey carefully all the commands, regulations, and decrees of the Lord our God. The next few verses unpack the detail of the religious offerings that they agree to make. And in chapter 11, Nehemiah lists how the returning Jews and those already in the land are to sort out who lives where. It's all carefully organised. And then we get to chapter 12, and we read about the dedication of the completed wall. First section from chapter 12 is verses 27 to 30. At the dedication of the wall of Jerusalem, the Levites were sought out from where they lived and were brought to Jerusalem to celebrate joyfully the dedication with songs of thanksgiving and with the music of cymbals, harps and lyres. The musicians also were brought together from the region around Jerusalem, from the villages of the Netophathites, from Beth Gilgal, and from the area of Geba and Asmaveth. For the musicians had built villages for themselves around Jerusalem. When the priests and Levites had purified themselves ceremonially, they purified the people, the gates, and the wall. We move on to verse 44 of chapter 12, verses 44 to 47. Special provision was made for the Levites and the choirs. Verse 44. At that time, men were appointed to be in charge of the storerooms for the contributions, first fruits, and tithes. From the fields around the towns, they were to bring into the storerooms the portions required by the law for the priests and the Levites. For Judah was pleased with the ministering priests and Levites. They performed the service of their God and the service of purification, as did also the musicians and gatekeepers, according to the commands of David and his son Solomon. For long ago, in the days of David and Asaph, there had been directors for the musicians and for the songs of praise and thanksgiving to God. So, in the days of Zerubbabel and of Nehemiah, all Israel contributed the daily portions for the musicians and the gatekeepers. They also set aside the portion for the other Levites, and the Levites set aside the portion for the descendants of Aaron. Then things began to go wrong again, and we see how Nehemiah tried to maintain the distinctives of Israel. We move to chapter 13, the first section, verses 4 to 11. Before this, Eliashib the priest had been put in charge of the storerooms of the house of our God. He was closely associated with Tobiah, and he had provided him with a large room, formerly used to store the grain offerings and incense and temple articles, and also the tithes of grain, new wine and olive oil, prescribed for the Levites, musicians and gatekeepers, as well as the contributions for the priests. But while all this was going on, I was not in Jerusalem. For in the 32nd year of Artaxerxes, king of Babylon, I had returned to the king. Sometime later, I asked his permission and came back to Jerusalem. Here, I learned about the evil thing Eliashib had done in providing Tobiah a room in the courts of the house of God. I was greatly displeased and threw all Tobiah's household goods out of the room. 
I gave orders to purify the rooms, and then I put back into them the equipment of the house of God with the grain offerings and the incense. I also learned that the portions assigned to the Levites had not been given to them, and that all the Levites and musicians responsible for the service had gone back to their own fields. So I rebuked the officials and asked them, why is the house of God neglected? Then I called them together and stationed them at their posts. Verse 14 of chapter 13. Remember me for this, my God, and do not blot out what I have so faithfully done for the house of my God and its services. In those days, I saw people in Judah treading wine presses on the Sabbath and bringing in grain and loading it on donkeys, together with wine, grapes, figs, and all other kinds of loads. And they were bringing all this into Jerusalem on the Sabbath. Therefore, I warned them against selling food on that day. People from Tyre who lived in Jerusalem were bringing in fish and all kinds of merchandise and selling them in Jerusalem on the Sabbath to the people of Judah. I rebuked the nobles of Judah and said to them, What is this wicked thing you are doing, desecrating the Sabbath day? Didn't your ancestors do the same things so that our God brought all this calamity on us and on this city? Now you are stirring up more wrath against Israel by desecrating the Sabbath. In the final section, verses 23 to 30 of chapter 13. Moreover, in those days, I saw men of Judah who had married women from Ashdod, Ammon, and Moab. Half of their children spoke the language of Ashdod, or the language of one of the other peoples, and did not know how to speak the language of Judah. I rebuked them and called curses down on them. I beat some of the men and pulled out their hair. I made them take an oath in God's name and said, You are not to give your daughters in marriage to their sons, nor are you to take their daughters in marriage for your sons or for yourselves. Was it not because of marriages like these that Solomon, king of Israel, sinned? Among the many nations there was no king like him. He was loved by his God, and God made him king over all Israel. But even he was led into sin by foreign women. Must we hear now that you too are doing all this terrible wickedness and are being unfaithful to our God by marrying foreign women. One of the sons of Joiada, son of Eliashib, the high priest, was son-in-law to Sanballat, the Horonite, and I drove him away from me. Remember them, my God, because they defiled the priestly office and the covenant of the priesthood and of the Levites. So I purified the priests and the Levites of everything foreign, and assigned them duties, each to his own task. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, we thank you for your word. We thank you that it's given to us for our instruction and our encouragement, and we pray that you would instruct us and encourage us from these chapters. In Jesus' name I speak. Amen. Amen. So there is the end of the story. No sooner do Nehemiah and Ezra get the people back into the land, uh, settled in cities and villages, Jerusalem functioning both as a city and as a center of worship. And what do we see happening? Our old friends, well, Nehemiah's great enemies, Sanballat and Tobiah, reappear. You will recall that they were the leaders of opposition to the construction of the wall in the earlier chapters. What has happened? Tobiah has toadied up to the priest, Eliashib, and so he's been provided with a storeroom in the temple precinct, a storeroom that was set aside for a special purpose, as we were told. So there's a massive rip-off going on here. No doubt Eliashib is taking his uh, cut from that. Sanballat had managed to arrange a marriage of one of his family, Sanballat's not a Jew, with Eliashib's family. The enemy had infiltrated the system and threatened to lead the people astray. So would all Nehemiah's great achievements come to nothing? At great personal cost to him and many others, he had spent 12 years on this project. Long time. 
he nipped back, having thought that he got it all under control, he nipped back at the uh, king's command to Susa uh, to check up that the wine is still being delivered properly to the king, no doubt, and uh, thought that his job was done. But on his return, some time later, we're told, we're not, not sure how long that was, he found things had gone badly wrong and he tried to sort it out. And he ends the book pleading with God to remember that he's done his best. He's, he's, he's tried hard. Now, we hardly need reminding this week of all weeks that a long campaign to clean up a country can very rapidly go to pot when our backs are turned and troops withdrawn. History has a way of repeating itself, does it not? This sermon was given the title by Gerald of Covenant, Commitment and Community. And I want to say a little about each of them uh, as they relate to Swinburne at 11, learning from the experience of Nehemiah. And obviously we have to recognise the very, very different times in which we live. So first, a covenant. Now, a few of us here have taken foreign wives <laughs> without disastrous consequences, I'm pleased to say. <laughs> so we need to interpret the Bible uh, quite carefully. Actually, this, this comes quite near home to me. Uh, we grew up in Sherburn, in Dorset, where my dad was the vicar. And as you probably know, there is a famous boys' school uh, in Sherburn, uh, in the town, and an equally renowned independent girls' school. Both my older brothers took themselves wives from the girls' school. But I caused a considerable stir by daring to take a bride who had gone to Northmoreland Lodge. And a feisty one with red hair, what's more. The consequences, as you see, have not been too disastrous. <laughs> Nehemiah knew that the establishment of of worship of Yahweh would be compromised if other religious influences were allowed back into society. That's why he got everyone to sign up uh, right at the start of Sue's reading, right to sign up to an agreement to keep the religious laws laid out in Deuteronomy. It, and they're spelt out in some detail in a bit of the chapter that Sue didn't read. Now we need to be careful how we apply this because we live under grace uh, not law. But surely we should, as believers, at least, like they did, hold each other accountable for our behaviour. That's one of the things that we can do as a family, as a Christian family. We meet here week by week in our home groups or in our prayer meetings or in prayer partnerships, just as families. And we bind ourselves, don't we, together in agreement that we will do our best to live Christianly. We agree, I think, that we will do our best to love God and love our neighbour, as the Bible commands us. And together we will help each other to do that. That is what this agreement that Nehemiah got the people to make was all about, that they will agree together to live godly lives. We should help each other to do that. And in recent times it's been hugely disappointing, especially for people like myself in Christian leadership, that some well-known Christian leaders have let the side down by wholly inappropriate and, in some cases, scandalous behaviour. That, that is one of the things that Nehemiah rightly feared would happen as soon as his back was turned. And Eliashib let, let, the, let the side down by letting Sambalat and Tobiah get too close to him. He who thinks he stand, beware lest he fall. We need to help each other to stand firm for thought. It's one of the things that church is all about come together to hear God's word, to pray, but also to fellowship, to support one another, to help one another live Christianly Monday to Saturday. It's the covenant that we make with each other each week. Secondly, commitment, the covenant. In order to ensure that his work would not be undermined, Nehemiah went to great lengths to deepen the people's commitment to one another and to their reordered land. Sue didn't read it, but it's, it's a huge part of this section of Nehemiah's book. The families are organised and land is distributed. 10% only of the people were to live in Jerusalem. The others, 90%, were to live in the villages and the countryside, which is obviously much less safe than the city because they have these fantastic new walls in the city 
to protect the people. But the prosperity of the nation, Nehemiah knew only too well, depended on a thriving agricultural economy. So as part of their commitment to the reconstructed country, they were to stay in the places allocated to them and farm that land so that the country prospered. It was a, a, a very important part of, of, the, of, the, of, of Israel and Judah being reconstituted as a, as a successful state. It'll be interesting as we watch what happens in, Af in Afghanistan if a similar thing can be happened or will the whole thing go to pot? now that it's not properly organized, or if it's not properly organized. Now, I wasn't quite sure how to apply this to us today here in Swinbrook, although it made, it made me think of, of many Christians who in recent years have moved home when a new church has been planted. I was reading about how Holy Trinity Prompton, big church in London, has planted churches as far away from London as Brighton, Cardiff, Plymouth, I think even one in America. And I expect that there are others who are doing the same thing. And church members, members of Holy Trinity Brompton and other churches who have done this, have physically moved in order to facilitate this happening. That involves a very high level of commitment, very high level of commitment. Rather more, perhaps, of a sacrifice than uh, the some of us made a few years ago when we stopped going to Burford and started coming to Swinbrook uh, or, or uh, moved from Cogs uh, to Swinbrook. For Sue, for Sue and me, it was a really big sacrifice. just meant we didn't have to drive so far. <laughs> but there was a real commitment, and the people were challenged to construct their lives in such a way that Judah and Israel could prosper. We also sometimes need to make commitments that are outside of our comfort zone in order for the gospel to prosper. Thirdly, community. We often say in these sermons that God's great plan, the plan of salvation, is to have his people living in his place under his perfect rule. God's people in God's place under God's rule. And if we look at the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 21, uh, it's, it's, chapter 21 of Revelation is often quoted at, um, at funerals for being the promise that God will, that there'll be no more... Um, death or mourning or crying or pain. You're quite familiar with that. What sometimes people miss is the verses just immediately before that in Revelation 21, 1 to 3 when it says this is, this is the great picture of how things will eventually be. Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and there was no longer any sea. The sea was a, a dreadful place of fear for most, peop most uh, Jewish people. I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed by her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Now the dwelling of God is with men, and he will live with them. They will be his people, and God himself will be with them and be their God. You see, the Bible ends with this picture uh, that Nehemiah longed for, of God's people uh, under God's rule, in God's place. The thing that Nehemiah, a man of his time, was trying to do, that's exactly what he was trying to do. He believed, of course, that God's people were exclusively the Jewish people. Therefore, intermingling by marriage or business with non-Jews was fraught with danger for Nehemiah. He believed uh, that what is now present-day Israel... Uh, was and always would be God's place. And he believed uh, that Israel should have no other king but the Lord. He didn't want there to be future kings. He wanted the Lord to be the king. So he turned down offers of kingship for himself. He didn't want to be king. Now I'm no expert on this, but I think that that is roughly the position taken by Zionists today. I think that's roughly what they would say. It gets a great deal of political support from certain sections of the Christian church, not least across the water in America. And it's a contentious minefield, uh, and I'm choosing not to wander into it. But it's interesting to note in passing how seriously, even fanatically, 
Nehemiah believed and what lengths he would go to to enforce it. He cursed foreigners and he pulled out chap's hair. <laughs> Painful experience. It is, it is an extreme kind of religious fanaticism. What I believe we can legitimately ask today is, who are God's people today? What place should they occupy? And who is their king? What is God's community today? God's people. Well, just have a little look around you. <laughs> Nothing very special, are we, really? Uh, we all have baggage. We all have joys and sorrows to share. We all have achievements to celebrate and sins to confess. Uh, to be honest, we don't look much different to the people who right now are walking past church and not coming in to join us. And I suspect that Nehemiah's returning exiles did not look much different from the nations round about, and often they didn't behave much differently to the nations round about. But we must read the Old Testament in the light of the New. And we need to read the New Testament in the light of the Old Testament. So I want you to listen for a moment to how the Apostle Paul describes you. This is his, his, his description of Swimbrook at 11. I'm reading from Ephesians chapter 1 and verses 13 and 14. And this is written to you and me. You also were included in Christ when you heard the word of truth, the gospel of your salvation. Having believed, you were marked in him with a seal, the promised Holy Spirit, who is a deposit guaranteeing our inheritance and the redemption of those who are God's possession to the praise of his glory. You and I, the Bible says, are God's possession. That will do for me. And I'm going to hang on to that precious thought for as long as I can, for as long as I live. So true believers in Jesus, Christians, Jew, Gentile, Protestant, Catholic, Orthodox, Baptist, Methodist, whatever you like, true believers in Jesus, whatever the label, God's people. God's people. What is God's place? Well, first of all, I acknowledge that many Christians will hold to the view that the land itself, Israel, remains very important. That it is a holy land. And I think Christians can legitimately take different positions on that and they should respect uh, people who don't uh, hold quite the same view as themselves. But what I think all Christians, all God's people, need to recognize is the G that Jesus inaugurated a new kingdom, a new spiritual place. There's a great scene in my favorite film, Chariots of Fire, where Eric Liddell, the great athlete and Christian uh, who became a missionary in China, is preaching after competing in an athletics meeting and, and in hushed tones to a rapt crowd uh, beside the running track, he preaches from Isaiah 40 and he says in a Scottish, in, in, in Scottish uh, accent that I can't do, he says, the kingdom of God is within you. The kingdom of God is within you. Therefore, wherever we are and whatever we are doing, we are in God's place. The kingdom is within us. It goes everywhere with us. When I first became a Christian, I mistakenly thought you could, uh, you could occasionally be off duty as a Christian. I thought that particularly when I was playing cricket and the umpire's decision went against me. <laughs> or more seriously, perhaps, when I was with a girlfriend. As I matured, I came to see that we are always in God's presence always on duty, and supremely so when it seems most difficult to live as a Christian. That's when we need to recognize we're in God's place all the time. But what a privilege, what a privilege. And who is our king? Well, you all know the answer to that. It's an old story, but it still makes me laugh. 
and I've told it numerous times, the Sunday school teacher looks out of the window and says, oh, children, look, a grey furry creature, what can it be? Well, says little Johnny, it looks mighty like a squirrel, but I guess, as usual, the answer is Jesus. <laughs> <laughs> Jesus. Jesus rode into Jerusalem on Palm Sunday as a king, but humble and servant-hearted and riding on a donkey. He is the king that we bow down to. He is the only king we need and the only king we will have in eternity. He is the Lord we obey. He is the saviour who loves us. So as I conclude, like many great people of the Old Testament, Nehemiah tried and ultimately failed, as we have seen, to establish God's people in God's place under God's rule. The hearts of the people were unchanged by law. And once again they fell away, led by Eliashib's dramatic uh, desertion of faithful living. Now we live by the grace and mercy revealed in King Jesus, in the Lord Jesus. By his spirit, our hearts are being changed. And by his mercy, we are forgiven day by day because of his once for all sacrifice. In a deeply troubled world, which we hardly need reminding of today, and even as we sit here a few miles away in Bryce Norton, the people are arriving back from Afghanistan. Our heroic forces who have done their best at the airfield and the desperate people of Afghanistan. But in a deeply troubled world, God has his people in his place living under his rule. There will be more of us in the world tomorrow than there are today. And the consummation that's promised in the book of Revelation will surely come. Let's pray. Lord, we thank you that uh, we can hang on to these great truths. Uh, we come, sometimes feel that, no doubt, we're hanging on them to, to them by our fingertips, as the people of Israel did in those long-gone days. But we thank you that there are unalterable facts. The Lord Jesus has come into our world. He is our King. He has paid the price of sin and risen to defeat even death. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain in the new kingdom. Help us to live as citizens in this world, caring for all those around us, but with one foot in heaven. And build your kingdom for your glory. Amen. Amen. Almighty God, who called your church to bear witness that you were in Christ, reconciling the world to yourself, help us to proclaim the good news of your love, that all who hear it may be drawn to you, through him who was lifted up on the cross and reigns with you in the unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. Amen. Amen. And the morning colic together. O Lord, our Heavenly Father, almighty and everlasting God, who has safely brought us to the beginning of this day. Defend us in the same with your mighty power, and grant that this day we fall into no sin, neither run into any kind of danger, but that all our doings may be ordered by your governance to do always that is righteous in your sight. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. Antonia is going to come and lead us in prayer. Just as she comes, I'm going to ask her one or two questions. I also just want to welcome one or two back. Nigel and Jeff have been away for ages. Welcome back. It's lovely to have you back with us and others who are here. But you've been away. And Olive's back too. It's great to see Olive, who may be asleep. I find my preaching has that effect on quite a lot of people. <laughs> Um, Antonia, you've been away a bit, but just tell us why you've been away, because it's been a great answer to prayer. Yeah. So if you can bear with me. Um, I just want to say thank you so much. Some of you know my daddy has had the most horrendously long, arduous few well, months of pain, really, and we've all been journeying with him, and you know, some of you know that, and you've all been so amazing praying. Basically, for those who don't know, he, um, got a, he's a clarinetist, and he found he had a lump in his uh, upper lip, 
and we'd known before it had been sort of cancerous, so we were a bit worried, and it was during COVID and lockdown. And so he needed an NHS appointment because he already had a defibrillator in his heart, which meant he couldn't go to a private hospital. And so we were praying, and we all knew the news that there was no NHS appointments for treatment of cancer. And we were praying, and as you know, we have our Monday prayer meeting, and if any of you want to come and join us, I would recommend it. It's a fantastic time when we support each other and we pray. And I remember Martin prayed specifically, and he said, Lord, I pray that it would become an NHS appointment for, uh, for Andy. And that week, phone call came, would you be able to come in next Monday? There's a cancellation. So that was amazing, and he got in and met a really good surgeon. And so we started, and they diagnosed cancer. And as a consequence of that, he was um, told he was going to have to have various uh, operations, each one um, sort of done on local, just where they were going to take a layer of the lip away, put it under um, a microscope, see if they got all the cells out, and keep going. So this process in itself, I think he went in for three times. Each time the wound got bigger and more of the, his upper lip was taken away and he was left with an open wound and we were dressing it and that was all quite hard. And um, eventually the surgeon said, right, we've got, we've got, we, we need to do reconstruction surgery now. So, um, and to our horror, and I'm a nurse, so I should be able to be grown up and co cope with this, but he said... Um, in order to, for the cell to, to, to sort of repair your lips, we need to reconstruct by sewing your lips together and leaving a tiny hole for you to be fed through a tube. So that, I just thought, with my mum, who's quite frail, this is going to be a nightmare. So we got ready for it, and the first day came, and this was last term, and I remember we all thought that he was having the operation. He went in first thing in the morning by himself, 5.30 in the morning by taxi, and then I was at work, and I got a telephone call from Daddy, and he said, darling, the operation's off. I forgot to go nil by mouth. So he got into the hospital, went to the canteen, had his sausages, went upstairs, and the surgeon said, and they just went, you know, they were a bit cross with him. He was devastated. So we felt we came down, all the way down the ladder, and sort of, sort of waiting for another appointment. Then the surgeon goes on holiday, so we have to wait. Then he gets another appointment. So we think, right, so we gear ourselves up, we make all the food, we get the carers ready. He, the night before, had his COVID test. The night before, ring, gets a telephone call, terribly sorry, you've got COVID. So he'd already been isolating five or six days. Then they had to isolate. Um, Daddy had COVID. On we go, praying. I'm like, what are you doing, Lord? Why are you not listening to our prayers? So we did that. Um, finally, uh, so then we set for the final, another operation date, and this was quite recently, and we all planned to go up and look after him. And uh, it was not until about, I think, under 24 hours before the operation, we knew it was going to go ahead. So he went ahead, and um, we took him, he was taken to Norwich Hospital, and I collected my mum, my heart was in my mouth because when he'd heard that he had COVID, his heart stopped. So he, got a, he has a defibrillator in his heart, and he was so stressed by the whole thing, his heart stopped. Thank God, defibrillator worked, and he was all right. So we were all heart and our hearts were in our mouths. I knew all the possibilities that could go wrong when you're having a surgery. And so we had mummy we all in Norfolk. And then at about um, half past three in the afternoon... I, got a, I saw, we were walking in the fields, I saw my phone was gone, it was dad, and I thought, oh no, it's been cancelled again. And I, ans I answered it, and he said, I'm alive! <laughs> and then I suddenly thought, he's talking. And uh, he said, please, can I come home? And I said, yes. He said, will you come and get me? I said, yes, we'll come and get you. Anyway, so we collected the next day. And he, he then told me the surgeon who had been on holiday, and he, Daddy describes how he looks so brown and tanned and relaxed. I said, that's good, you want a rested surgeon. You don't want someone to... You want the team, this might be good. And he saw Andy, who... And, and the, the, the anaesthetist said, oh, yes, you're the sausage man. You ate sausages, didn't you, last time? So it was all a bit of a disaster. And the surgeon's mouth, he, his face lit up as he saw Daddy. And he said, Andy... It's healed so well because he had so all this time had this socking great open wound, no infection. Amazingly, it had sort of healed in an odd way. It didn't look great, but it was healed in a funny sort of way. As a consequence of that, so as a consequence of this long delay, the surgeon was able to 
suture un, uh, cut around his nose, and he somehow, as a plastic surgeon does, managed to make a new top lip and top bit, no mouth sewn up, and he was able to eat and drink, and he's doing well. So I just wanted to thank you all for praying. I mean, I, I said, I remember saying to Diane, I said, I am sulking with God. I feel like sulking. And my sister said, there's no point because you have to come back anyway. But I, you know, it was so, so hard. But I just want to encourage you when you're praying for whatever you're praying and it doesn't seem to be answered and you think, this is what, what am I doing praying? I would just encourage you to keep going and just thank you so much for helping me and supporting me. And he knew all of you. I said, Daddy, there's 46 people praying for you today in church, whatever. So thank you very much. Sorry I've gone on a bit, but I was so excited to tell you all. Um, so we're just going to pray now. Um, and today I'm going to focus the majority of our prayers on Afghanistan. And I've used material from Pete Gregg, who is the founder of something called 24-7. Um, this recent statement was given to Pete from an organization in Afghanistan, which obviously has to remain anonymous for obvious reasons. And this is what the man said. The fear for the Afghan people is not so much the unknown, but rather the known, a brutal regime where daily life is filled with unbearable tension, regular public executions, oppression for women, fear of a knock at the door from the Taliban. For too long, people in Afghanistan have looked for salvation from Western powers. Well, that hasn't worked. We need our brothers and sisters in the global church to take spiritual responsibility and to stand with us in prayer. Psalm 62 says this, Let all that I am wait quietly before God for my hope is in him. He alone is my rock and my salvation, my fortress where I will not be shaken. Trust in him at all times. Pour out your heart to him, for God is our refuge. So let's pour out our hearts to the Lord now and lift our prayers urgently to heaven. Dear Heavenly Father, we want to lift to you your church in Afghanistan. We pray for protection. We pray you, the God of Shalom, would send your peace into every troubled heart. We ask you to give our brothers and sisters courage in Christ. They must be understandably terrified. We pray that you, would, that you would know in the depths of their being that you are walking with them and among them, saying, may they know these words from Luke, do not be afraid, little flock, for your father has been pleased to give you the kingdom. We pray that your Holy Spirit amidst the chaos and pain, would awaken their hearts, expand their minds, and shape their identity in you. Lord, in your mercy. Amen. We pray that you would give wisdom and clarity of thought to those in positions of responsibility. Show them the right political and humanitarian solutions for the vast number of Afghan refugees, ordinary people suddenly displaced from their homes by the terror of the Taliban. As Nahum chapter 1 says, may they discover that you, the Lord, is good, a stronghold in the day of trouble, and he knows those who take refuge in him. May you give them eyes to see and ears to hear, help them to discern where you are at work. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. we pray that you'd give wisdom to all the world leaders 
as they seek to respond diplomatically, building an in essential international consensus for peace. Your word says in Proverbs 8, counsel and sound judgment are mine. I have insight, I have power. By me, kings reign and rulers issue decrees that are just. Father, we pray that you, your will be done in Af Afghanistan. Deliver them from all evil. We ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. And so, God of Shalom, we offer up our worries to you now. We bring you our brokenness. We surrender to you our striving. Let us rest in your presence and receive your peace. Help us to learn to live freely and lightly. Help us to walk with you. Help us to learn your unforced rhythms of grace. And in a moment of silence, we welcome you, we offer up those who we know who are unwell. We particularly lift up to you, Gordon in Astor Lee and Wendy, his wife. We lift up Gwen, who had a fall recently and is badly bruised. We pray your blessing upon them and healing. And in silence, just lift up anyone who comes to mind. So shall we join together and say the Lord's Prayer. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as in heaven. Give us today our daily bread. 